purpose of this lecture is to explore the very controversial topic of hydrofracturing. Hydrofracturing is controversial because of the methods that are employed and beyond that how rapidly this practice has risen in the past few years. What this lecture hopes to do is take an objective look at this and not come into it from any particular ideology. To provide an objective based lecture what I did is I explored a range of books on this topic that range from very much uh, objective based view by Alex Prudhomme to a pro hydrofracturing perspective by Gregory Zuckerman to objective but slightly against the boom by Russell Gold. I would encourage you if you find interest or if you would like to place any arguments with other individuals on this controversial topic that you read all three of these books before you take any type of stand because it's very important when we examine something like this that we are informed before we start putting ourselves in any one political or environmental position. Beyond that there are some excellent web sources for this. NPR has some great stories on this topic that date back uh, all the way back to 2008 and they have an excellent archive for you to be able to search that. An affiliate of NPR would be Marketplace. Marketplace also has some great stories on this topic. One of the best sources out there for energy in general is the oildrum.com. There's some great blog posts on that. And then thinkaboutit.org, this is a very pro natural gas website. This is put out by the Natural Gas Alliance. But at the same time, it's a great way to start thinking about how hydrofracturing relates to many different facets of your everyday lives. So what exactly is fracking? Fracking is in many ways considered by those who are against hydrofracturing a term that's used in a derogatory manner and it's used to describe hydrofracturing. However, the term fracking is also used within the industry. It can have different spellings. Sometimes you see this without the K in the spelling. Sometimes you have the, just a shortening to a frack. But what this is, is it's a process that harnesses horizontal drilling technology and hydraulic fracturing techniques to extract oil and gas deposits from shale formations deep underground. So it's, it's not just the, the process that fractures the, the rock formation. What you have is you have the ability to drill horizontally into the formation instead of just through it. There's key points in this definition. As I said, it's a horizontal drilling method and it's hydraulic fracturing. What does that mean? The fracturing doesn't come so much from setting off explosives underground, which has been done in the past, but you force so much water and other chemicals, as we'll see as part of the controversy along with sand, into that hole that you actually create large cracks in the shale rock to be able to get the, the, um, the coveted gas or oil out of that shale. The targeted material is shale bedrock and it's used to produce both oil and gas. Shale for years has been known to contain extensive amounts of oil and gas but the problem was was that the porosity was so much and the permeability or the ability for those materials to move through that shale was so little that it, we couldn't extract it out of that rock. But with this technology now millions upon millions upon millions upon millions of, of barrels of oil are now available that were known for many years but now are available for extraction. So if we take a look at fracking from a geospatial perspective we can start to look at the United States and we can see why the United, why the United States is so poised to benefit from this technology in terms of providing a lot more energy within our own borders. We sit on quite a few different formations that contain these deposits. And if we were to go to this story map, what this story map provides us is a really nice look at these different formations and it also gives us a lot of great information on what these different formations contain. So if we were to click on them, we can get an idea of how much material these different shales have, what the name of the formation is.
So we have the Bakken shale, the Bakken shale. We can also get an idea of how much production has come out of these to date. In this case, to 2011 of when this map was made. So I encourage you to take a look at this map to get an idea of where hydrofracturing is taking place. And also to get an idea of how that might relate to where you live and your perspective on it. All of these formations are shale formations. And they're shale formations that are often in conjunction with other oil formations that for years the people who were extracting these materials, these, uh, these other hydrocarbons out of the ground, knew of these shale formations, but they were considered of a rock that it was not something that was, that was economically viable because of the fact that those shales could not be extracted. Affiliated with the hydrocarbon industry and fra hydrofracturing is a new resource that comes about in places like Wisconsin and Minnesota for that matter. And this is industrial sand mining or frac sands. These these, hydro, these industrial sand operations come about because in the hydrofracturing process what you need is a very well-rounded and well-sorted sand. And in this case, these Cambrian sandstones are very well-suited for hydrofracturing. And so what's come about from that is an explosive growth in these different sand mining operations. Now, these operations are not without controversy in themselves. There's controversy in terms of how much loads the uh, traffic bringing these materials out of these mines will have on county roads. County roads are only designed to take so much tonnage, and when you start increasing the tonnage, you increase the cost of maintaining those roads. Beyond that, you also have the controversy of the particulates that might be associated with these operations. This is also controversial and there isn't a lot of base data to go on and so there's there's still a lot of there's there's a lot of debate on in, in terms of the overall impact of the particulates that are associated with these. Of course there is the argument of how much economic growth these generate and the amount of job growth that they produce. This held true in the past until recently. With the recent uh, bottoming out of oil prices as of this lecture date of April 2015, many different sand mining operations in, within the state are now scaling back and actually starting to unemploy their workers. So when we start looking at the economic growth associated with things like the shale gale or this hydrofracturing industry or their affiliated industries such as industrial sand mining, what we have to realize is that jobs like this and economic growth like this does tend to fluctuate. That said, there is still going to be quite a demand for these, um, for these industrial sand mines in the near future. If we look at a very short history of hydrofracturing, we want to look at it in terms of shale long been known to contain hydrocarbons. But as I've stated previously in this lecture, those shales were difficult to, ex to, to work with. The, the oil and the gas in those shales was in them, but to get the, those materials out was very, very cost prohibitive. The method of fracturing the rock to get materials out of it has been used for a long time. Going all the way back to the 1860s, drillers were using methods such as explosives to fracture the rock to get more oil out of the rock. Now this wasn't always used in, in shale, this was used in our more conventional oil deposits and it was just a means of getting that oil to flow a little bit better through things like the oolitic limestone or different uh, various deposits of limestone rock with that oil and or gas. Of course using explosives and um, flammable material would be not a good idea at best, but when it, when it comes to uh, the, the different um, uses of technology, we can look back to the 1860s in terms of how rock was fractured. We go all the way up into the modern day and we look at George Mitchell. And George Mitchell was an individual who for years upon years, going all the way back into the 1980s, was looking at these different shale deposits and knowing that shale, that the shales contained gas and that they contained oil, 
but becoming very, very frustrated with the fact that those things could not be taken out economically. There was a lot of hydrofracturing going on, but when the hydrofracturing was first going on, it was more or less a gel, and the gel was very expensive to use. Finally, what one of uh, George Mitchell's drillers figured out was that if they use predominantly water, and then they also had that sand in the water, they could achieve a fairly successful fracture in the formation. This occurred down in Texas, in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. That technology soon spread in popularity, and before long it was being used in many different areas around the United States. This led to the land grab rush, and one of the biggest, uh, in the biggest companies involved in the land grab rush was Aubrey McClendon. Aubrey McClendon is not without controversy himself. He served as the head of Chesapeake Energy, the CEO of that company, and what Chesapeake Energy was doing was they were using investment dollars and going out and buying land that started out very cheap, but soon was going up to eight, nine, ten thousand dollars an acre for leasing drilling rights. What th this led to was a rush to grab land by other companies, and in order for that land to become productive, what had to happen was that land needed to be drilled. A drilled well is going to become a, a productive well, which is then going to pay off the investment. What that led to, though, is the need to produce faster and faster led to, in many cases, an overlook of safety standards for the drillers on the website, but also safety in terms of the environmental ramifications for a bad well. What was very interesting about this that was within the industry, within the industry, privately the industry was begging for some type of a regulation because that regulation would have evened the playing field for all of the different drillers involved and it wouldn't have led to this mad dash rush to get these wells put into production to pay off the investment dollars. So when we start looking at the controversy of hydrofracturing, what we need to take a do is take a step back and look at this objectively and say, is this the method or is this m many of the different uh, factors that go into this? And from the readings that I've conducted in, in, in pursuit of preparing this lecture, what really struck me was that hydrofracturing to date, although the regulations are starting to creep in, the method is not exactly new, and we can see that by looking back to the 1860s. What's new was the explosive growth of putting so many different wells in in such a short period of time. And we'll explore that in a little bit, but indeed, within, within, since from 2008 until now, if we just looked at the sheer number of wells put in, it's, it's astronomical. If we look at this from the extreme views, I'm going to place the Fracno crowd on the left and the Drill Baby Drill types on the right. And what I'm trying to do in this lecture is find that middle ground between these two extreme views. And what I find with these extreme views is in many cases both crowds are, are misinformed or they are misinforming the public in their stance. If we look at the frack milk crowd, their stance would be that oil and gas companies have no regard for the environment. They would propose that fracking has a larger carbon footprint than coral, than coal. This, uh, much of this uh, sentiment comes from a study put out by Cornell. That fracking uses desperately needed water. And finally, that fracking should be banned outright. If we look at the drill baby drill types, one of the first things that they would say is, it's not even so much anti-fracking crowd as it's anyone who puts forth any type of uh, sentiment for regulation is that by limiting hydrofracturing and trying to curb its growth is anti-American. And uh, in fact, I've even heard it to where uh, hydrofracturers and the drillers have been referred to as terrorists, which I find very extreme. They would also say that regulation is too costly and prevents production, and this gets into the anti-American. 
in that regulation it holds back the industry and that with regulation production can be prevented. And then you would have the there are no harmful chemicals in hydrofracturing. This, uh, <laughs> this can actually stem all the way back to in one particular shareholders meeting uh, there was a particular CEO who took the hydrofracturing fluid and in front of everyone actually drank it. Um, he later on said that it tasted horribly and he wouldn't recommend it but the, there, there is middle ground in these statements. And then finally safety issues are being addressed internally within the industry. I would would like to go from here and provide you with a with a look at this that kind of addresses both of these views down the middle because both of these views and and both sides when we start having those ideological blinders on we need to take a step back and and start peeling away some of these uh, myths if you would coming from both sides of the aisle. If we look at the good of hydrofracturing there, there is no doubt that hydrofracturing has produced a lot of good, especially when we start looking at these regions where hydrofracturing is taking place. If we go back to 2008 and we look at the entire nation, the two states that were not in a recession were Wyoming and North Dakota. Both of those states were heavily involved with uh, hydrofracturing in, uh, in, in most cases in the Bakken Shales. There are a lot of direct high paying jobs in the industry. 600,000 jobs were within the industry in 2012. <coughs> and it's projected that by 2020, there'll be 2 million jobs. Now the caveat here is that it's very difficult to project job growth in an industry like this because in industries like this, when you have the ability to to make that much money and also when you have the need to pay off the venture capital and you, you you engage in that much drilling you tend to get into overproduction which tends to flood the market which then leads to um, many times a pendulum swing of overcutting back on production and that overcut back on production has implications on how many people are employed in the industry this is not this is not uncommon and this happens in many different areas it's actually occurring in the unmanned aerial vehicle airspace as well so when we look at that projected two million growth we want to take that with an asterisk we also look at this in terms of land lease payments and, and this this gets into some of the interesting controversy with this because when we start looking at the areas where you do have hydrofracturing taking place the people who are often in support of it, and not always, there are definitely people who are very unhappy with what happened with their land lease, but in many cases in the, the regions where this is taking place, the, the people who are against it are the ones who are in the region who aren't in the land lease payment system. If those people are in the system to where they happen to have property over the formation where their land was leased for the $16,000 an acre and then some, those people tend to be happy. The people who aren't involved in that are the ones who tend to be unhappy. And of course this is where we get a lot of finger pointing and within the industry there's a lot of pointing that's saying it's the people from the urban areas. When we start looking at places like Pennsylvania, it's people who are coming from Pittsburgh and Philadelphia who are against it, but when we start looking at the people for it, it's the people in the region. Now can we categorically say that that's the case across the board? No. But at the same time, what we definitely can do is we can take a step back and say there are quite a few people who have made quite a bit of money on land that was semi-productive at best to date and then have made quite a bit of money on the land lease payments because they happen to be sitting on these formations. Another fact that we need to consider is that it has led to an increase in U.S. manufacturing. Prior to the hydrofracturing boom, what we had was we had a net loss of US manufacturing jobs going overseas. Indeed this lecturer himself in 2008 told to a class that manufacturing in the United States was fairly pretty much a dead industry. I admit I was wrong and many economists out there are needing to admit that they are wrong as well because what this production has done is it's lowered our hydrocarbon uh, prices, particularly that of natural gas, 
to the to the fact that now it's cheaper to bring our production back within our borders than to send that overseas. And so this gets into the halo effect. The halo effect means that beyond those direct jobs associated with the industry, the cheaper natural gas and the availability of oil now makes it economically provides an economic incentive for that for manufacturers to come back within our borders. We also need to look at that it is revolutionary to US energy prospects. There has been a reduction to US energy costs as I mentioned in the halo effect. We need to look at this in terms of US energy independence. By 2020 shale oil is going to be producing 6 million barrels a day of oil. Beyond oil the US is projected to become a net exporter of natural gas in the next few years. This relates to many, many, many different facets within our economy, but also just how we view how we deploy our military and how we have a stance in, in global geopolitics. We also need to look at this in terms of the climate change implications. Hydro hydrofracturing if we just look at this in terms of how we produce our electricity has been responsible for a reduction in CO2 emissions. 450 million metric tons were reduced between 2007 and 2012 when we look at how much less coal we're burning. If we look at the year 2000 coal is 52 percent of our electricity and 2012 it fell to 38 percent of our electrical production. We can look at that in these figures if we look at these figures, we go back into the uh, the 1990s, and we can look at how natural gas was fairly low on the charts. We see that coal was at 52 percent. If we move ahead into about the year 2012, what we see is that natural gas going from 16 percent in the late 1990s has jumped to 30 percent. And by the time we get to 2040, it's going to be well over 35 percent, considering that already natural gas has exceeded its expectations in terms of how much of our, ener our electrical energy is coming from natural gas. Coal, on the other hand, you see a decline. And here again, it's very difficult to make these projections because one of the ways that these projections can change is that if renewables, the technology of renewables, gets better and more economically uh, provides more of an economic incentive that might overtake natural gas. Likewise if coal starts getting taxed more for its environmental implications we might see an even further reduction of coal and a bigger rise in natural gas. But the projections right now stand that right now if we want to just look at this from an overall big picture, we're going to see less and less coal producing electricity and more and more natural gas. How renewables fit into this matrix depends a lot on, in terms of government incentives and how we can have that technology become cheap enough to compete with natural gas. We look at this from these pie charts. What we can see in these pie charts is we can indeed see how going from 2007 all the way up to 2013, we see how the piece of the pie of coal for electrical, for electrical power generation gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Well, at the same time, natural gas gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Let's talk about a little bit of the bad with hydrofracturing, though, because hydrofracturing is not without its problems. As I was stating before in the good, Hydrofracturing does provide a disruption to communities. If we look at this, we look at some of these communities, and we have communities that were many times in very much a rural area, ranging from pristine environments to very beautiful rural landscapes. And when you have this type of an industry come along, you have a lot of heavy equipment, you have a lot of noisy equipment, and you, of course, have the smells associated with hydrocarbons. This does disrupt a community. And for those who are getting the land lease money, the smell of the, the, those uh, gas flares burning off may smell like money, but to those who are not getting any money off it, 
it smells like rotten eggs. So we have to look at this in terms of winners and losers. Beyond that, what we also need to do is we need to revisit that idea of industrial sand mining or within these communities, what that equipment can do to county roads. One of the biggest complaints that, that I've heard and that I've researched is that when we start looking at industrial sand mining, when we start looking at hydrofracturing, very few times do you hear of the industry willing to pay for that road maintenance. And to me, that's unfortunate because it only breeds to the breeds the controversy in the fact that for those who are against this type of an industry, will have they they have fuel to say that indeed these companies have no regard for the environment. To me, this is unfortunate because road maintenance is essential not only for these vehicles to travel on these roads, but also for those people who live in those communities. There are gas leaks associated with this. Now, when we look at methane migration, this is where we have quite a bit of controversy. But then again, methane migration is something that's happened well before hydrofracturing took place. If we look at places in the Appalachians where we have this industry taking place, there are towns called Flaming Springs. Why are they called Flaming Springs? Because these towns well before any of these types of uh, operations were put in place had methane migrating to the surface and these springs were flaming. Water wells tend to be very shallow while gas wells tend to be very deep. Now that said there is methane migration that occurs when we have a faulty well getting put in. This isn't so much related to the drilling technique as it's related to putting in the casing. And here again, we revert back to the issue with having venture capital and moving as fast as you possibly can to put something into production and not stopping to engage in what's called a green completion. And with that green completion, or further beyond a green completion in terms of capping all the leaking gases, making sure that that concrete casing does not have cracks or leaks in it, that would make a huge difference. But that takes more time and that prevents you from putting in more wells and therefore your stock falls and therefore your company might not be able to continue to grow. With regulation put in place, that would put a rule into the entire industry and the entire industry, if they are forced to do this, then there, everyone would be put in the same position and we wouldn't have the same mad dash. But methane migration is indeed something that's cited quite a bit and if we go beyond some of the natural methane migration there are wells that were put in and, and uh, finished poorly where that has occurred. We also look at this with CO2 emissions. Now this is where it gets very interesting and controversial because there was a study that was put out by Cornell that said that the amount of CO2 that came out of wells that were that were hydrofractured is, is actually worse in terms of how much gas leaks versus that of burning coal. But then MIT came along and did a follow-up study and they found quite a few faults in Cornell's study. And one of the biggest faults that they found was that that assumes that the wells, none of these wells were completed and that um, all the gases were basically assumed to leak off. What is being put in effect as of 2015 are green completions. And a green completion means that, uh, among other things, that all the gases that uh, are associated with putting in this well are captured and stored, or at least injected back into the, into the surface, under the surface. So with that, really that Cornell study does become quite questionable. We also need to look at this in terms of groundwater contamination. Here again, one of the, one of the, the, the problems is that we are dealing, the, the beauty of, of hydrofracturing comes from the fact that we had the ability for, for, in the United States, for venture capitalists to explore this and there was that true American capitalistic spirit to move this forward. But at the same time, that true spirit has led to some, some controversy in, in the fact that we don't know what goes into these hydrofracturing fluids. It's, it's an industry secret. And that those fluids 
can contaminate groundwater if you don't have a properly drilled well and you don't have those improper environmental regulatory practices taking place. One of the biggest problems is what's known as the Halliburton loophole. The Halliburton loophole, um, it's related to, to Vice President Dick Cheney, who basically um, was, was in, heavily involved with producing a law that said that this industry does not need to disclose what chemicals it uses in its hydrofracturing operation because those are industry secrets. And there, both sides of the aisle can, can take a look at this and say, yes, indeed, we, we are validated in, in, in what our stance is on this. Because if we do look at this practice, we, we do need to know that this is a competitive industry and the the materials that this industry is using they definitely cannot be sharing because there's a lot of money that they invested into developing these these fluids but at the same time when we start looking at the implications of groundwater contamination some balance needs to be struck between the industry at least disclosing to the to these different regulatory bodies what is going into these fluids in case we do have some type of an environmental situation where we need to assess the the the, uh, the magnitude of what might have taken place. If we look at water consumption, water consumption is 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 fairly interesting when it comes to fi hydrofracturing because once again we revert back to green completions. And when we start looking at green completions, a lot of that water can actually be injected back into gr into the ground. But then we look at the controversy with groundwater and the Halliburton loophole and we can see why many people are wary of injecting water with unknown chemicals back in the ground. Hydrofracturing currently is responsible for about 0.3 percent of US water consumption or 135 billion gallons of water. Now that might seem like a lot but when we start looking at this in, re in regard to a uh, practice such as agriculture, agriculture in the United States uses 32,840 billion gallons of water. Much of that water in agriculture as we're seeing with the drought in California as of 2015 is very poorly utilized and evaporates off into space because of the, the flood irrigation methods and whatnot. Beyond that, we look at something like golf courses. Golf courses use even more than hydrofracturing at 0.5%. And golf course water is not reused. That material is definitely lost off into the atmosphere because of things like evapotranspiration. So, well, we can say that hydrofracturing does use a lot of water consumption. When we start looking at hydrofracturing and starting pointing fingers at what needs to go when we have droughts in areas like the southwest in California, we also need to start pointing fingers at other practices such as golf courses. And then finally, one big recent controversy is earthquakes. Now, as of this lecture, I have not been able to research this to the degree where I feel comfortable making any type of a stance on this, but what I can tell you is that earthquakes are on the rise in places like Oklahoma, and some of these earthquakes have actually been fairly strong in recent months, if not years. As information develops on that, I'm sure that you will hear more and more in terms of what is going on with hydrofracturing and how that's related to seismic activity in these different areas where the practice is occurring. If we move into the unintended with hydrofracturing though, if we start looking at the boom that started in 2008, we look at the relationship of that economic boom starting and the onset of our recession and what many economists are now saying, and this gets into how Wyoming in North Dakota were in economic surpluses while the rest of the country had states in deficits. Many economists are now looking back at this and saying that this boom and this this availability of natural gas on the market and the jobs that it produces that it produced and the 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 ability for manufacturing jobs to come back to the country Many economists are saying that this, in many ways, was highly responsible for offsetting the economic meltdown in 2008. And that if we didn't have this industry uh, taking off, 
the economic meltdown that we were experiencing could have been a lot worse than what it was. We have to look at hydrofracturing in regard to global geopolitics and how much the United States has in terms of clout with the rest of the world. We look at what Russia has been doing in recent months and recent years. We look at how Russia has uh, turned off gas to Western Europe and the Ukraine and the bullying tactics that Russia has practiced. And we look at what the United States has been able to do in that regard. There are many people within, the, within inner circles of uh, the energy industry who will say flat out that the United States has a lot more clout at the negotiating table because of what we can bring to in terms of exporting natural gas to offset some of the stances and some of the, the outright um, abusive human rights practices that Russia has been engaging in. We look at this in terms of US policy on Middle Eastern foreign policy and how we deploy our military around the world and what we're seeing more and more of is debate within our own Pentagon and military circles on how with our increased domestic production with our ability to produce natural gas with what we have going on in Canada and the potential for hydrofracturing places like Mexico that perhaps our military presence in the Middle East is not as important as it once was. Now, of course, this isn't a, a, a military geography class, and I don't want to get into that in too much detail. But when we start looking at that topic, that could be that could be an entire class on its own. We also want to look at this in terms of our relationship to China, because one of the most interesting facets of what's going on right now is how just recently the United States announced how, as of April 2015, 2015 that the United States is looking at investing quite a bit in terms of energy in the uh, in the Caribbean region. What's also interesting is how much China has moved in aggressively into the Caribbean. So what the United States is able to do by providing energy into places like the Caribbean is to offset the potential influence of China in that region. Beyond that China, as they grow, even though they have ample energy deposits, they have a much bigger population and their consumption is becoming so large that the United States is going to surpass China as a net energy exporter. That is, China is going to have to start importing more and more energy while the United States is not going to have to import as much as China anymore. We also look at this in terms of deepening of large political rifts. Hydrofracturing is definitely contributing to the large rift between the Republican and Democratic parties. To me this is very unfortunate because it's not an ideological issue. It's an issue that definitely requires an, uh, uh, an objective based view. But what we tend to see is we tend to see Democrats being against hydrofracturing and we see Republicans being for it. Now, this also relates to geographic location. If we start looking at some of these different regions, we can definitely see how these party lines don't necessarily follow that debate. What we also saw with hydrofracturing, as I stated before, was we saw runaway investment capital strategies. This was, this, this was the beauty of, of the system that we had in place to have this boom take place. But at the same time, I see this as the bane. Because one of the biggest problems with what happened with hydrofracturing was with that investment capital and the lack of regulation that within the industry there were some who were secretly begging to have this happen, is that we had, we had a runaway series of wells getting put in. And when those wells got put in, even though it was a very, very small amount, the, the focus on making sure that those those concrete casings were crack free and that those gases, the green the, the green completions were taking place didn't occur. That only created more controversy and in 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 many ways I would say the industry um, made a mistake in doing this in that that led to a very large anti hydrofracturing stance to where if they were more open and we're more open to regulation, we might not have seen the, the controversy that we see today. The unintended as well, as I said before, is that boom and bust economy. 
We see that in Wisconsin right now with the industrial sand mining operations with the slowdown in production of these wells. This isn't so much unintended, but it's just very difficult to, to deal with something like this and know when to increase production and when to, to, to decrease it. There's entire classes that are taught on this that just relate to, to how the oil industry is very subject to this boom and bust type cycle. So if we look at this with objective based conclusions in the future, one thing that I will tell you whether or not you're for this or against it is that hydrofracturing methods are here to stay. They're not going to go away. Not when we are that dependent on hydrocarbon still. What I would tell you is that they are less harmful than the critics claim, but they do produce more damage than the industry intends or discloses. I would also tell you to expect more regulation within the industry. As the boom cycle is winding down, what, you, what you're going to see is you're, you're going to see um, the green completions becoming mandatory. You're going to see more and more of proper drilling methods and concrete casings put in place. But what we also need to look at when we, when we objectively look at hydrofracturing, even though it's here to stay, is how will renewables compete with cheap natural gas and, and more oil on the market as a, as a consequence of hydrofracturing. What I would tell you with my own um, objective based uh, opinion here is that the shale gale, which is the, the, the name applied to this, this boom in hydrofracturing techniques, should be treated as a bridge measure. Even though the United States is sitting on quite a large deposit and other areas of the world have extensive deposits of these hydrocarbons associated with bringing this technology to the table, it's still not a forever energy deposit. And my biggest worry is that what the United States is going to treat this shale gale as is, um, is a moment of, boy, that was really close. It's a good thing that we have these shales now and because now we can ignore having to pursue things like solar energy and wind energy. I, it is in my hope that we do not neglect those different um, energy sectors and that we continue to pursue those forms of technology and we use, the, we use what is in many ways a gift to us as a bridge to move into that next generation of energy production. Currently, wind power with subsidies is competitive with natural gas, but without the subsidies, it, it, it would be more expensive. And so how we treat wind and how we pursue development of solar technology is something that we really need to look at as we move along down the road with hydrofracturing.